Greetings, Milwaukee, my fellow Americans and my fellow Republicans. My name is J.D. Vance from the great state of Ohio. Tonight, O-H-I-O, O-H-I-O. You guys, we gotta, we gotta chill with the Ohio love. We gotta win Michigan too here, so. <laughs> My friends, tonight is a night of hope. A celebration of what America once was, and with God's grace, what it will soon be again. And it is a reminder of the sacred duty we have to preserve the American experiment, to choose a new path for our children and grandchildren. But as we meet tonight, we cannot forget that this evening could have been so much different. Instead of a day of celebration, this could have been a day of heartache and mourning. For the last eight years, President Trump has given everything he has to fight for the people of our country. He didn't need politics, but the country needed him. Did it? Now, prior to running for president, he was one of the most successful businessmen in the world. He had everything anyone could ever want in a life. And yet, instead of choosing the easy path, he chose to endure abuse, slander, and persecution. And he did it because he loves this country. I want all Americans to, to go and watch the video of a would-be assassin coming a quarter of an inch from taking his life. Consider the lies they told you about Donald Trump, and then look at that photo of him, defiant, fist in the air, when Donald Trump rose to his feet in that Pennsylvania field. All of America stood with him. And what did he call us to do for our country? To fight, to fight for America. Even in his most perilous moment, we were on his mind. His instinct was for us, for our country, to call us to something higher, to something greater, to once again be citizens who ask what our country needs of us. Now consider what they said. They said he was a tyrant. They said he must be stopped at all costs. But how did he respond? He called for national unity, for national calm, literally right after an assassin nearly took his life. He remembered the victims of the terrible attack, especially the brave Corey Compertori, who gave his life to protect his family. God bless him. And then President Trump flew to Milwaukee and got back to work. Now that's the man I've gotten to know personally over the last few years. He is tough, and he is, but he cares about people. He can stand defiant against an assassin one moment and call for national healing the next. He is a beloved father and grandfather, and of course, a once in a generation business leader. He's the man who is feared by America's adversaries, but two nights ago, and I'll share a moment, said goodnight to his two boys, told them he loved them, and made sure to give each of them a kiss on the cheek. And I will say, Don and Eric squirmed the same way my four-year-old does when his daddy tries to give him a kiss on the cheek. Sorry, guys. 
He is all those things, but tonight we celebrate he is our once and future President of the United States of America. Now, I want to respond to his call for unity myself. We have a big tent in this party on everything from national security to economic policy. But my message to you, my fellow Republicans, is we love this country and we are united to win. Now, I think our disagreements actually make us stronger. That's what I've learned in my time in the United States Senate, where sometimes I persuade my colleagues and sometimes they persuade me. And my message to my fellow Americans, those watching from across the country, is shouldn't we be governed by a party that is unafraid to debate ideas and come to the best solution? That's the Republican Party of the next four years, united in our love for this country and committed to free speech and the open exchange of ideas. And so tonight, Mr. Chairman, I stand here humbled and I'm overwhelmed with gratitude to say I officially accept your nomination to be Vice President of the United States of America. Never in my wildest imagination could I have believed that I'd be standing here tonight. I grew up in Middletown, Ohio, a small town where people spoke their minds, built with their hands, and loved their God, their family, their community, and their country with their whole hearts. But it was also a place that had been cast aside and forgotten by America's ruling class in Washington. When I was in the fourth grade, a career politician by the name of Joe Biden supported NAFTA, a bad trade deal that sent countless good jobs to Mexico. When I was a sophomore in high school, that same career politician named Joe Biden gave China a sweetheart trade deal that destroyed even more good American middle class manufacturing jobs. When I was a senior in high school, that same Joe Biden supported the disastrous invasion of Iraq. And at each step of the way, in small towns like mine in Ohio or next door in Pennsylvania or Michigan, in states all across our country, jobs were sent overseas and our children were sent to war. And I agree. And somehow, a real estate developer from New York City by the name of Donald J. Trump was right on all of these issues while Biden was wrong. <laughs> President Trump knew even then that we needed leaders who would put America first. Now, thanks to these, these policies that Biden and other out-of-touch politicians in Washington gave us, our country was flooded with cheap Chinese goods, with cheap foreign labor, and in the decades to come, deadly Chinese fentanyl. Joe Biden screwed up, and my community paid the price. Now, I was lucky. 
despite the closing factories and the growing addiction in, in towns like mine. In my life, I had a guardian angel by my side. She was an old woman who could barely walk, but she was tough as nails. I called her Mamaw, the name we hillbillies gave to our grandmothers. <laughs> Mamaw raised me as her own, excuse me, Mamaw raised me as my mother struggled with addiction. Mamaw was in so many ways a woman of contradiction. She loved the Lord, ladies and gentlemen. She was a woman of very deep Christian faith. But she also loved the F word. I'm not kidding. She could make a sailor blush. Now she once told me when she found out that I was spending too much time with a local kid who was known for dealing drugs, that if I ever hung out with that kid again, she would run him over with her car. That's true. And she said, JD, no one will ever find out about it. Now, now, thanks to that mammal, things worked out for me. After 9-11, I did what thousands of other young men my age did in that time of soaring patriotism and love of country. I enlisted in the United States Marines. <laughs> Semper Fi to my fellow Marines. Now, I left the Marines after four years and went to THE Ohio State University. I'm sorry, Michigan, I had to get that in there. Come on, come on. We've had enough political violence, let's... Now, after Ohio State, I went to Yale Law School, where I met my beautiful wife. And then I started businesses to create jobs in the kind of places that I grew up in. Now, my work taught me that there is still so much talent and grit in the American heartland. There really is. But for these places to thrive, my friends, we need a leader who fights for the people who built this country. We need a leader who's not in the pocket of big business, but answers to the working man, union and non-union alike. A leader who won't sell out to multinational corporations, but will stand up for American companies and American industry. A leader who rejects Joe Biden and Kamala Harris's Green News scam and fights to bring back our great American factories. We need President Donald J. Trump. Some people tell me I've lived the American dream, and of course they're right, and I'm so grateful for it. But the American dream that always counted most was not starting a business, or becoming a senator, or even being here with you fine people, though it's pretty awesome. <laughs> My most important American dream was becoming a good husband and a good dad, of being able to give... <laughs> I wanted to give my kids the things that I didn't have when I was growing up, and that's the accomplishment that I'm proudest of. That tonight, I'm joined by my beautiful wife, Usha, an incredible lawyer and a better mom, and our three beautiful kids, Ewan, who's seven, Vivek, who's four, and Mirabelle, who's two. Now, they're back at the hotel, and kids, if you're watching, daddy loves you very much, but get your butts in bed. It's 10 o'clock. But my friends, things did not work out well for a lot of kids I grew up with. 
Every now and then, I will get a call from a relative back home who asks, did you know so-and-so? And I'll remember a face from years ago, and then I'll hear, they died of an overdose. As always, America's ruling class wrote the checks. Communities like mine paid the price. For decades, that divide between the few with their power and comfort in Washington and the rest of us only widened. From Iraq to Afghanistan, from the financial crisis to the Great Recession, from open borders to stagnating wages, the people who govern this country have failed and failed again. That is, of course, until a guy named Donald J. Trump came along. President Trump represents America's last best hope to restore what, if lost, may never be found again. A country where a working class boy born far from the halls of power can stand on this stage as the next Vice President of the United States of America. But my fellow Americans here in this stage and watching at home, this moment is not about me. It's about all of us, and it's about who we're fighting for. It's about the auto worker in Michigan wondering why out-of-touch politicians are destroying their jobs. It's about the factory worker in Wisconsin who makes things with their hands and is proud of American craftsmanship. It's about the energy worker in Pennsylvania and Ohio who doesn't understand why Joe Biden is willing to buy energy from tin pot dictators across the world when he could buy it from his own citizens right here in our own country. You guys are a great crowd. Wow. And, And it's about, our movement is about single moms like mine, who struggled with money and addiction, but never gave up. And I'm proud to say that tonight my mom is here, 10 years clean and sober. I love you, mom. And, and, and you know, Mom, I, I was thinking it'll be 10 years officially in January of 2025. And if President Trump's okay with it, let's have the celebration in the White House.
And our movement, ladies and gentlemen, it's about grandparents all across this country who are living on Social Security and raising grandchildren they didn't expect to raise. And while we're on the topic of grandparents, let me tell you another mammal story. Now, my mammal died shortly before I left for Iraq in 2005. And when we went through her things, we found 19 loaded handguns. They were... Now, the thing is, they, they were stashed all over her house, under her bed, in her closet, in the silverware drawer. And we wondered what was going on, and it occurred to us that towards the end of her life, Mamaw couldn't get around so well. And so this frail old woman made sure that no matter where she was, she was within arm's length of whatever she needed to protect her family. That's who we fight for. That's American spirit. Now, Joe Biden has been a politician in Washington for longer than I've been alive, 39 years old. Kamala Harris is not much further behind. For half a century, he's been the champion of every major policy initiative to make America weaker and poorer. And in four short years, Donald Trump reversed decades of betrayals inflicted by Joe Biden and the rest of the corrupt Washington insiders. He created the greatest economy in history for workers. Yeah. Really was amazing. There's, there's this chart that shows worker wages, and they stagnated for pretty much my entire life until President Donald J. Trump came along. Yeah. Workers' wages went through the roof. And just imagine what he's going to do when we give him four more years. Months ago, I heard some young family member observe that their parents' generation, the baby boomers, could afford to buy a home when they first entered the workforce. But I don't know this person observed if I'll ever be able to afford a home. The absurd cost of housing is the result of so many failures, and it reveals so much about what's broken in Washington. Now, I can tell you exactly how it happened. Wall Street barons crashed the economy and American builders went out of business. As tradesmen scrambled for jobs, houses stopped being built. The lack of good jobs, of course, led to stagnant wages. And then the Democrats flooded this country with millions of illegal aliens. So citizens had to compete with people who shouldn't even be here for precious housing. Joe Biden's inflation crisis, my friends, is really an affordability crisis. And many of the people that I grew up with can't afford to pay more for groceries, more for gas, more for rent, and that's exactly what Joe Biden's economy has given them. So prices soared, dreams were shattered, and China and the cartels sent fentanyl across the border, adding addiction to the heartache. But ladies and gentlemen, that is not the end of our story. We've heard about villains and their victims. I've talked a lot about that, but let me tell you about the future. President Trump's vision 
is so simple and yet so powerful. We're done, ladies and gentlemen, catering to Wall Street. We'll commit to the working man. We're done importing foreign labor. We're going to fight for American citizens and their good jobs and their good wages. We're done buying energy from countries that hate us. We're going to get it right here from American workers in Pennsylvania and Ohio and across the country. We're done sacrificing supply chains to unlimited global trade, and we're going to stamp more and more products with that beautiful label, Made in the USA. We're going to build factories again put people to work making real products for American families made with the hands of American workers. Together, we will protect the wages of American workers and stop the Chinese Communist Party from building their middle class on the backs of American citizens. Together, we will make sure our allies share in the burden of securing world peace. No more free rides for nations that betray the generosity of the American taxpayer. Together, we will send our kids to war only when we must. But as President Trump showed with the elimination of ISIS and so much more, when we punch, we're going to punch hard. <laughs> Together, we will put the citizens of America first, whatever the color of their skin. We will, in short, make America great again. You know, one of the things that you hear people say sometimes is that America is an idea. And to be clear, America was indeed founded on brilliant ideas like the rule of law and religious liberty, things written into the fabric of our Constitution and our nation. But America is not just an idea. It is a group of people with a shared history and a common future. It is, in short, a nation. Now, it is part of that tradition, of course, that we welcome newcomers. But when we allow newcomers into our American family, we allow them on our terms. Amen. That's the way we preserve the continuity of this project from 250 years past to hopefully 250 years in the future. And let me illustrate this with a story, if I may. I'm, of course, married to the daughter of South Asian immigrants to this country. Incredible people. People who genuinely have enriched this country in so many ways. And, of course, I'm biased because I love my wife and her family, but it's true. Now, when I proposed to my wife, we were in law school, and I said, Honey, I come with $120,000 worth of law school debt and a cemetery plot on a mountainside in eastern Kentucky. And I, I, I guess standing here tonight, it's just gotten weirder and weirder, honey. <laughs> but, that, but, but that's what she was getting. Now, that cemetery plot in eastern Kentucky is near my family's ancestral home. And like a lot of people, we came from the mountains of Appalachia into the factories of Ohio, Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin.
Now that's Kentucky coal country, one of the 10. Now, it's one of the 10 poorest counties in the entire United States of America. They are very hardworking people, and they're very good people. They're the kind of people who would give you the shirt off their back even if they can't afford enough to eat. And our media calls them privileged and looks down on them. But they love this country not only because it's a good idea, but because in their bones they know that this is their home and it will be their children's home, and they would die fighting to protect it. That is the source of America's greatness. As a United States Senator, I get to represent millions of people in the great state of Ohio with similar stories, and it is the great honor of my life. Now, in that cemetery, there are people who were born around the time of the Civil War. And if, as I hope, my wife and I are eventually laid to rest there, and our kids follow us, there will be seven generations just in that small mountain cemetery plot in eastern Kentucky. Seven generations of people who have fought for this country, who have built this country, who have made things in this country, and who would fight and die to protect this country if they were asked to. Now, now, that's not just an idea, my friends. That's not just a set of principles. Even though the ideas and the principles are great, that is a homeland. That is our homeland. People will not fight for abstractions, but they will fight for their home. And if this movement of ours is going to succeed, and if this country is going to thrive, our leaders have to remember that America is a nation and its citizens deserve leaders who put its interests first. Now, we won't agree on every issue, of course, not even in this room. We may disagree from time to time about how best to reinvigorate American industry and renew American family. That's fine. In fact, it's more than fine. It's good. But never forget that the reason why this United Republican Party exists, why we do this, why we care about those great ideas and that great history is that we want this nation to thrive for centuries to come. Now, eventually, in that, that mountain cemetery, my children will lay me to rest. And when they do, I would like them to know that thanks to the work of this Republican Party, the United States of America, and as strong and as proud and as great as ever, That is who we serve, my friends. That is who we fight for. And the only thing that we need to do right now, the most important thing that we can do for those people, for that American nation that we all love, is to reelect Donald J. Trump, President of the United States. Mr. President, I will never take for granted the trust you have put in me. And what an honor it is to help achieve the extraordinary vision that you have for this country. Now, I pledge to every American, no matter your party, I will give you everything I have to serve you and to make this country a place where every dream you have for yourself, your family, and your country will be possible once again. And I promise you one more thing. To the people of Middletown, Ohio, and all the forgotten communities in Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, and Ohio, and every corner of our nation, I promise you this. I will be a vice president 
who never forgets where he came from. Hello, America. I'm Christy Shamblin. My daughter-in-law, Sergeant Nicole Leanne G. Was a United States Marine, and she was killed at Abbey Gate in Afghanistan, alongside 12 of her brothers and sister-in-arms. While Joe Biden has refused to recognize their sacrifice, Donald Trump spent six hours in Bedminster with us. He allowed us to grieve. He allowed us to remember our heroes. Donald Trump knew all of our children's names. He knew their stories, and he spoke to us in a way that made us feel understood, like he knew our kids. He carried, Donald Trump carried the weight for a few hours with me. Yeah. And for the first time since Nicole's death, I felt I wasn't alone in my grief. Thank you. I had expected to meet an arrogant politician. Instead, I met a man who had empathy for us. He was compassionate, and he spent time with us because he knew it would make us feel better. Thank you, President Trump. I'm Cheryl Jules, Nicole's aunt. Joe Biden said the withdrawal from Afghanistan was an extraordinary success. An extraordinary success. Look at our faces. Look at our pain and our heartbreak. And look at our rage. That was not an extraordinary success. The humiliation of our nation was not an extraordinary success. Right. Joe Biden may have forgotten that our children died, but we have not forgotten. Donald Trump has not forgotten. Joe Biden owes the men and women that served in Afghanistan a debt of gratitude and an apology. Yep. Donald Trump loves his country and will never forget the sacrifice and bravery of our service members. Join us in putting him back in the White House. I'm Alicia Lopez, and this is my husband, Herman. Our son, Corporal Hunter Lopez, whose name Joe Biden has refused to say out loud, was killed on August 26, 2021. He died during Joe Biden's disastrous withdrawal from Afghanistan. 
Hunter was 22 years old and planned to come home to California after his tour to follow in our footsteps. Herman and I work for the Riverside County Sheriff's Office And our family has a tradition of service in law enforcement. Hunter was excited to carry it on. Instead, in the nearly three years since Hunter's been gone, there has been silence. Silence from that empty space at the dinner table where Hunter would have joined his brothers and sister and us for family gatherings. And there has been a deafening silence from the Biden and Harris administration. Despite our pleas for answers and accountability, they have pushed us away and tried to silence us. The Biden administration has not owned up to the bad decisions. They have not been transparent about their failures. And their so-called leaders work to protect themselves rather than our sons and daughters who took the oath to defend our country. Thank you. When Hunter and the other service members' bodies were returned to the U.S. in Dover, Delaware, Joe Biden met the plane. But he made the occasion more about his son, lost to cancer, than our sons and daughters, lost on his watch. Worse than that, he has never said their names out loud. And during, and during last month's debate, he claimed no service members have died during his administration. None. That hurt us all deeply. So Alicia and I are here to say the names of all 13 service members who lost their lives. All 13 service members who lost their lives at Abbey Gate. David Espinoza. Nicole G. Taylor Hoover. Ryan C. Knaus. Riley McCollum. Dylan Marola. Kareem Nakui. Dagan Page. Johanny Petardo. Umberto Sanchez. Jared Schmitz. Maxton Soviak. And my son, Hunter Lopez.
Joe Biden has to go. He failed the American people. He failed the Afghan people and our military service members. He failed our family, and he failed Hunter. Donald Trump has a proven record of keeping the peace and honoring those in uniform. All of us on this stage recognize the efforts of Mr. Trump. We know this firsthand. We've experienced it. Whenever we've met with him, he has demonstrated compassion. He has joined us on our mission for answers. And he has given hope to our extended Gold Star family. Now, we have another son serving in the Army. And we do not trust Joe Biden with his life. We have faith that Donald Trump to lead our military Please join us in supporting Donald Trump for President and Commander-in-Chief. I'm speaking today to share the side of my grandpa that people don't often see. To me, he's just a normal grandpa. He gives us candy and soda when our parents aren't looking. <laughs> he always wants to know how we're doing in school. When I made the high honor roll, he printed it out to show his friends how proud he was of me. I know. He calls me during the middle of the school day to ask how my golf game is going and tells me all about his. <laughs> but then I have to remind him that I'm in school and I'll have to call him back later. <laughs> when we play golf together, if I'm not on his team, he'll try to get inside of my head. Yeah, I know. And he's always surprised that I don't let him get to me. But I have to remind him, I'm a Trump too. <laughs> Even when he's going through all these court cases, he always asks me how I'm doing. He always encourages me to push myself to be the most successful person I can be. Obviously, he sets the bar pretty high, but who knows, maybe one day I'll catch him. <laughs> On Saturday, I was shocked when I heard that he has been shot, and I just wanted to know if he was okay. It was heartbreaking that someone would do that to another person. A lot of people have put my grandpa through hell, and he's still standing. Grandpa, you are such an inspiration, and I love you. The media makes my grandpa seem like a different person, but I know him for who he is. He's very caring and loving. He truly wants the best for this country, and he will fight every single day to make America great again. Thank you very much. Tonight we gather here in Milwaukee at one of the most crucial moments in American history. Just days ago, something that once seemed unimaginable became a terrifying reality. My father came under literal fire as an incredible patriotic rally turned into a tragedy. On a field in Butler, Pennsylvania, a brave firefighter died. Others were injured. And as those bullets 
rained down, we came millimeters away from one of the darkest moments in our nation's history. But we did lose an American hero that day. We wish that he were with us tonight. But his memory will live on forever in the hearts of his family, his community, and the nation that he loved. So I would like to take just a moment tonight to express our gratitude for the life and service of American hero, Corey Comparator. They say you can't truly know how you'll respond in a moment of danger until you're actually confronted with it. So what was my father's instinct as his life was on the line? Not to cower, not to surrender, but to show for all the world to see that the next American president has the heart of a lion. That the next American president has the courage to put the American people first once again. And in that moment, my father didn't just show his character. He showed America's character. When he stood up with blood on his face and the flag at his back, the world saw a spirit that could never be broken. And that is the true spirit of America. America knows what it's like to be down. We know what it's like to be confused and to be afraid. Long before the attempt on my father's life, every American I met was filled with fear and anxiety. They were afraid our country was being torn apart. They were anxious about the massive and chaotic invasion of illegal aliens across our border. They were deeply concerned about partisan lawfare, education indoctrination, and attacks on freedom of speech. Most terrifying of all, they saw that our leaders didn't care, or worse, that they joyfully aided and abetted the erosion of our rights. And the lies. Oh, yeah, the lies. We won't ever forget the lies. From left-wing politicians, from their allies in the media, when you hear them in a row, you fully understand the extent they have gone to divide this great nation. They lied about Russia collusion. They lied about Hunter's laptop. They lied about Joe Biden's fitness for office. They lied about the border being secure. They lied about inflation being transitory. They lied about how they would safely withdraw from Afghanistan. They lied about Biden being a, quote, moderate. And they told one nonstop lie after another about my father. But they could only run away from reality for so long. All hell has broken loose in America, and it's impossible to hide anymore. Remember Build Back Better? <laughs> Instead, we got broke, bumbling Biden. Nothing is built, nothing is back, and nothing is better. Bridges are collapsing. Our credibility is crumbling, and our money is worth less and less every single day. It was just one giant bait-and-switch, and normal Americans are the ones left holding the bag. 
housing costs, gasoline prices, grocery bills just keep going up. Wave after wave of illegal aliens, deadly drugs keep pouring across our border. Meanwhile, pro-crime district attorneys have turned our cities into giant crime zones. They've turned criminals into victims, prosecutors into criminal defense attorneys, and police into public enemies. Left-wing activists are pretending to be educators, teaching our kids that there are 57 genders, but they can't even define what a woman is. On one hand, they think free speech protects their right to expose your children to explicit drag shows. On the other hand, they want to put you in jail for making a meme. It's like the entire world has been turned upside down. Does any of this sound like a country that's going in the right direction? And honestly, who is actually running the country anyway? It's obviously not Joe Biden. So who are they asking us to elect? Seriously, who's running things? Does anyone really know? Is it Jill? Is it Hunter? Barack Obama? Maybe it's the ghost of Corn Pop. Whoever is running the show, the only thing they are effective at is persecuting my father. They twisted, contorted, and corrupted the criminal code to turn bookkeeping errors into fennelies. They concocted new legal theories out of thin air. They imposed gag orders on my father because the last thing a defendant should be able to do is defend himself, right? They punished him for merely speaking the truth. They say they hate Vladimir Putin, but it sure seems like they've spent a lot of time copying his playbook. In this country, we don't criminalize political differences. We debate them. We vote on them. But we don't make you choose between picking a party or picking a jail cell. There was a time when the Democrats really wanted what was best for America, even if they had a different way of getting there. It was the party of Franklin Roosevelt, John F. Kennedy, Martin Luther King, Jr. You may have disagreed with that party, but at least you could respect it. But this new extreme Democrat party, they want us to somehow believe that the only way forward is going backwards, where hiring decisions are based solely on race, where justice is only for those with the right opinions, where streets are a luxury only for the elite, where economic opportunity exists only when you know the right people. Right now, the America we all grew up with, the America that we love, feels like an old photograph, where you sit down with your children and tell them what life used to be like. You look back at that America and remember a country that was confident and proud, an America that knew who it was and what it stood for. And it could all feel like a distant memory. Somewhere along the way, we stumbled. Somewhere along the way, we lost ourselves. But we can't live on nostalgia. Yes, America was great, but our greatest days are yet to come. Because no matter how far off that old photo may feel, it's not the end of our story. We're like that man who stood on that platform and felt the bullet pierce his flesh just days ago in Pennsylvania. He may have moved to the ground, but he stood back up.
And when he did, my father raised his fist into the air. He looked out at the crowd. And what did he say? And we will fight. We will fight. We will fight with our voices. We will fight with our ideas. And on November 5th, we will fight with our vote. I've always been proud of him, but I've never been prouder of my father than I was in that moment. That's when the world found out that there is tough, and then there's Trump tough. And the good news is, America is Trump tough. In 1912, more than a century ago, another legendary Republican president came right here to Milwaukee. At a political rally less than one mile from where we stand tonight, Teddy Roosevelt was struck by a would-be assassin's bullet. But he didn't quit either. He finished his speech and he kept fighting. My friends, I don't believe in coincidences, but I do believe in God's plan. Today, Teddy Roosevelt's man in the arena has a name, and it's Donald J. Trump. Remember, my father didn't have to run for re-election this year. He doesn't need the money, the fame, the power. Frankly, he doesn't need the witch hunts, the phony investigations, or the political prosecutions either. But he knew he had to run if there was any chance at saving America. He's not doing it for himself. He's doing it for everyone here tonight for everyone watching at home. No matter who you are, you can be a part of this movement to make America great again. Look at me and my friend J.D. Vance, a kid from Appalachia and a kid from Trump Tower in Manhattan. We grew up worlds apart, yet now we're both fighting side by side to save the country we love. And by the way, J.D. Vance is going to make one hell of a vice president. For those of you who have tuned out politics or have never even voted, I want you to know, if you're looking for a better life, a more prosperous future, a safer, more wholesome and patriotic place to call home, there's room for you in this party and in this movement. In fact, you're the ones who matter most of all. 
My father has always said that the people he gets along with best are the people who really work for a living. It's because of his background as a builder in construction, right? In construction, it doesn't matter how smart your architect is if you don't have the best guys laying the bricks. People with grit, people who get their hands dirty. That's a big problem with Washington, D.C. Most of the bureaucrats who rule over us have never built anything in their lives. It's time to build something real, something tangible, something that will last and leave this country better off for our children. That's my father's mission. This November, we have a choice. It's a choice between one team that wants to build this country up and another that wants to tear this country down. It's a choice between people who are proud of America and people who are ashamed of America. And ultimately, it's a choice between America last and America first. So if you love this country from the bottom of your heart, if you want to bring back common sense, if you want to save the American dream, if you want to stand up and fight for the future of our nation, you must re-elect my father, Donald J. Trump. I'm a proud Wisconsinite. Proud. I'm a proud husband of 76 years old to my wife, Rosemary. I'm, I'm a father of 11 children. Six girls, five boys. Our family across five generations and a proud World War II veteran. I'm 90, 98 years old. Some call us the greatest generation. That's, that's an honor considering America is the greatest nation in the history of the world. I will never forget and witness the horror of the Nazis' war camps. In the Battle of the Bulge, my friends and I fought to stop the Nazis' last major push in the Western Front. A few months later, Hitler was dead. Uh, Hitler was dead. The, Nazi, the Nazis were defeated. We were, and we gave thanks to Almighty God for delivering us from evil. But not many of us came home. I still miss a lot of my friends on that beach. And we're, there were many of us left. There aren't many of us left today. But for us, those who of us who are here, that America is still worth fighting for.
It hurts my heart to see what our current president and vice president have done to the country I love so well. They humiliated us in Afghanistan. We pushed around in China. Terrorists run wild in the Middle East. And they let our own southern border get overrun. America, people say, people is, is an, America is an idea, but I believe America is much more than that. America, America is our home. You know, when I was fighting in Europe and I came back home, I kissed the ground, thanking God that I'm back home in our, my country. And where I come from, when somebody comes for me, or my home, you dig in your boots and the ground and never look back. <clears throat> That's the attitude that saved the free world and those years ago. And President Trump, back in Commander in Chief, I would go back to re enlist today. <laughs> And I, I was stormed. Whatever beach you want, my country wanted to, needs me to fight again. God bless you. God bless our home. And the United States of America. When I was asked to introduce my husband, J.D. Vance, to all of you, I was at a loss. What could I say that hasn't already been said before? After all, the man was already the subject of a Ron Howard movie. <laughs> J.D. has shared much of his life through his own eloquent words. In his book, Hillbilly Elegy, during his Senate campaign, and now as a sitting United States Senator. It occurred to me that there was only one thing to do, to explain from the heart, why I love and admire J.D. and stand here beside him today, and why he will make a great Vice President of the United States. I met J.D. in law school when he was fresh out of Ohio State, which he attended with the support of the GI Bill. We were friends first because, I mean, who wouldn't want to be friends with J.D.? He was then, as now, the most interesting person I knew. A working class guy who had overcome childhood traumas that I could barely fathom to end up at Yale Law School. A tough Marine who had served in Iraq, but whose idea of a good time was playing with puppies and watching the movie Babe. The most determined person I knew with one overriding ambition, to become a husband and a father, and to build the kind of tight-knit family that he had longed for as a child. My background is very different from JD's. I grew up in San Diego, in a middle-class community. Yeah. 
with two loving parents, both immigrants from India, and a wonderful sister. That JD and I could meet at all, let alone fall in love and marry, is a testament to this great country. It is also a testament to JD, and it tells you something about who he is. When JD met me, he approached our differences with curiosity and enthusiasm. He wanted to know everything about me, where I came from, what my life had been like. Although he's a meat and potatoes kind of guy, he adapted to my vegetarian diet and learned to cook food from my mother, Indian food. Before I knew it, he had become an integral part of my family, a person I could not, man could not imagine living without. The JD I knew then is the same JD you see today, except for that beard. <laughs> and, and his goals in this new role are the same that he has pursued for our family, to keep people safe, to create opportunities, to build a better life, and to solve problems with an open mind. It's safe to say that neither JD nor I expected to find ourselves in this position. But it's hard to imagine a more powerful example of the American dream. A boy from Middletown, Ohio. raised by his grandmother through tough times, chosen to help lead our country through some of its greatest challenges. I am grateful to all of you for the trust you have placed in him and in our family. And with that,